Okay, so I want to talk about un Laplace transforming stuff. So let me just clarify notation for a second. So the notation that I'm using is if you Laplace transform a function f of t, right? The way you do that is you take the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus st times the function f of t dt, right? Alternatively, you go look it up in the table, right? So you Laplace transform a function little f, and you get a function big f. And if I was being really precise about dependencies, that's a function little f of t, and big s, big f is a function of s. s. Right, so that's from time, like from a place about time to a place about whatever the hell s is. Yeah, so I kind of bounced off into magic land here, right? And then I might fiddle around with my differential equation. Is with me? So, for example, let's see. If I had y prime is e to the 2t, right? you could Laplace transform both sides of this equation. Right? And you would get, okay, so y prime is f of s, or s f of s. Okay, so it's f, or s times the Laplace transform of y, y uh, minus y of zero. Minus y evaluated at zero, right? And on the other side, you would get 1 over s minus 2. 1 over s minus 2. Okay, so this would tell you that you have like s times some function capital Y minus Oh, what the heck, let me give you a number. Let me say y of 0 is 1, just for kicks. So you have s times y minus 1 equals 1 over s minus 2. And then you might be like, oh, what the heck. Uh, I want to find out what y is, right? Like that's my goal. So I'm going to settle for finding out what capital Y is. So I'm going to take this thing, I'm going to add 1 to the other side, I'll get s times capital Y is 1 over s minus 2 plus 1. Then I'll pull a classic and divide by s. So I'll get y is 1 over s times s minus 2 plus 1 over s. And then I'd be like, k. <laughs> Cool. So this this was that like the idea of the steps here, right? Is this step is like go to Magic Land, right? Like so, take your little journey to Magic Land. Now you're in S's. Then you like do some algebra, right? Which gets you to here, but you're trapped in Magic Land. Right? And so what you would like to do is you would like to back out of magic land. You guys see that? So at this point here, this capital Y, what was that standing in for? The Laplace of the function of S or function of T. Y. Yeah, that was supposed to be the Laplace transform of the thing I was looking for, right? I was looking for little y. I have the Laplace transform of little y here. If that was something that I recognized, I could be done. Is that? So what I need to do is develop a theory for un-Laplace transforming this thing. Right? So one way I could do that, just like the maybe simplest thing you could try, it's like just, I don't know, right? Little y is the Laplace transforms backwards direction. <laughs> done to this stuff. Right? 
right? Okay, so now I think we need to spend a minute and develop a way to back out of Laplace transforms. Is that, so the, the, the normal Laplace transform is, a, is some kind of integral. Is this actually some kind of derivative? Because derivatives are kind of undo integrals. Yeah, you can I know kind of think that it. way. Uh, so let me tell you this. There is a formula for obtaining an inverse Laplace transform. It lives in complex variable land. Uh, so I'm not going to take you there. Like that's a rabbit yeah, hole I'm not going to fall down. He does. He has one very oh, like. Yeah. There's one sentence <laughs> which says, and there is a formula for this, but I'm not going to teach oh, it to you. Okay. He's saying the exact same thing I am, yeah. for the exact same reason. Yeah. Like I don't want to spend four days developing a theory of complex equations so that I can teach you how to integrate complex equations so that we can talk about this when it's actually not so hard to just break things apart. So what I'm going to teach you is the algebraic method to inverse Laplace transforms, which is we're going to spend a minute developing a way to break this up into things that look like stuff on this table. And then we'll just back out of the table. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Like right now, that part, the 1 over s, that's a lot. <laughs> That's probably one. <laughs> you guys with me on that? That thing may be more, common, uh, more complicated. So do you guys want to try this one while we've got it? Sure. OK. So let me do something that's not in evidence. So this is a weird step. This is the Laplace trans, the inverse Laplace transform is linear, meaning I can break that into, oops, shoot, I lost my y. Meaning little y is the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s times s minus 2 plus the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s. With me on that? Mm -hmm. Like, that's not an evidence, right? In no way have I convinced you that this <laughs> has to be the case. It is. Trust me. It's one of the little theorems I'm going to write on the board later and totally omit the proof. The reason I'm omitting the proof is that it goes to complex variable length again. But it's pretty believable because the Laplace transform itself is a linear operator. So it's relatively believable that the kind of inverse of a matrix should itself be a matrix, right? Mm -hmm. That's a wild, like, <laughs> this is not a matrix. The Laplace transform is not a matrix. It just kind of halfway acts like one, right? And then it's linear. OK, at any rate, uh, you guys spotted this one. So this one from the table was? one. Okay. The very least I've got part of this sucker down. <laughs> All right. So for the other one, oh, I'm glad I erased my differential equation. That'll make life a lot easier. I don't have to own up to that. <laughs> okay. So I want to look at that 1 over s times s minus 2. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. This is saying that the Laplace transform of 1 is 1 over s, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's really just me looking at the table and being like, oh, dude, that's the first line. Yeah, that's what I was just making sure, like. Yeah, so if I had to come up with justification for this, this line would be the Laplace transform of 1 is 1 over s. And so if you slap an inverse on both sides, it seems like you get one back. I should get 1 back, right? Yeah, makes sense. I haven't even really probably convinced you that this operator should be invertible, but that's a really like much longer conversation. I've seen it in the book and I've seen it on the board, so I figured I was. Just You're just going to go along with it. Yeah, I guess. Okay, cool. <laughs> that's good. It's a level of trust you shouldn't have, but whatever. <laughs> okay, so at any rate, I'm looking for this thing just kind of off in the margin, right? So I'm not working, like, I'm working towards that goal, but I just took that part over here. Okay, so 
do I see something like this in the table? You know, if you look down the table, is there an S times S minus something in here? No. Crap. Okay, so, but there is a S minus something in there, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, on the first line, there's a 1 over S. Like, that part's doable, the 1 over S piece. And the 1 over S minus 2 piece is doable. Yeah, you'd love to be able to. You can't. <laughs> but what you can do is think about breaking them into pieces. So further in the margin, <laughs> you're going to take this guy and you're going to think to yourself, OK, so 1 over s times s minus 2. You guys remember a trick for breaking this into bits over s's and bits over s minus 2's? Partial fraction. Yeah, this is partial fraction decomposition, mm. which is fully magic. Say so you do A and B, right? And then you get yourself a common bottom. Yeah, so let me show you the easy, really, really nasty trick. It's easy, but it's a nasty trick. So get your common bottom, right? So what's your common bottom over here? It's S times S minus 2. So what does this dude need? It's an S minus 2. So you do A times S minus 2. And then this guy needs an S, so you do B times S. Forget the bottom. And then the dirty trick is you evaluate where the bottom would have been zero. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Well, it yeah, so. But it's weird that you just have an S, right? Yeah, so you just take this thing and evaluate, like, call this equation star, right? You can just do it. Linear. And do. Yeah, you can do it the silly way. Or the, the right way too. Like but this is silly and fast, so I'm teaching it to you. So evaluate when s is 0. When s is 0, that part's 0, right? Mm -hmm. And this part's minus 2. So you get 1 is a times minus 2. Right? If you take star and evaluate where s is 2, you get 2b is 1. Sick, dude. That was pretty chill, right? Uh, yeah, so this thing is called heavy sides method. Oh, is that related to the heavy side function at all? No, it's the same guy. Uh, it should be noted that Heaviside's method is a really strange trick. Like when you're evaluating at s is 0, right? You're plugging s is 0 into this. <laughs> you are fully dividing by 0, fully on purpose. You guys see that? Yeah. And it seems to work. Yeah, it, so this is a dirty trick related to the order of poles in the complex plane, but don't sweat it, it just works. Okay. Doesn't, it fall, doesn't this fall apart somewhere, though? Uh, yeah, you want to be careful when you have a repeated root because you won't quite be able to find things easily. Yeah, so if one of your roots, like if you have an s minus 2 squared, remember you need another plus a c over s minus 2. Yeah. And then you want to be careful of applying heavy sets method there. Okay. There's other things you can do. The book outlines one. I'll outline one later. You guys cool with this? So however you do this, you can go ahead and use the old school partial fraction decomposition if you want. Doesn't matter. You will get that you need to Laplace inverse Laplace transform. Let's see. A was negative a half. So I'm going to do negative a half over s. And then I need plus a 1 half over s minus 2. Right? OK? Then? Back to the chart? Not quite. Close. Use that thing about linearity that's not in evidence. So colors. Take this guy. Pop it out. Take this guy. Pop it out. Pop across the plus. 
Okay, I just set a bunch of stuff. That'll get you to minus one half the inverse Laplace transform of one over s. Plus one half inverse Laplace. Of plus one half the inverse Laplace transform of one over s minus two. One over s minus two. No one. And then you go look at the table. Right? So you go look at the table for the plus transform that gives you 1 over s. You find 1. one. So you get minus 1 half times 1 plus 1 half. E to the 2t. E to the 2t. Right? And then you take that information, you walk it over here to where you were working before. And you get your one half, or sorry, minus one half plus one half e to the two t. Combine like terms. Combine like terms. So you get your y is one half e to the two t plus one half plus one half. So IVP solved. Check that. Cool. So, if I knew how to inverse Laplace transform, everything that I was going to get in the end of Magic Land, we would be really set to go. You all on board with that? Okay, so this was like the easy partial fractions one. Cool. Basically, this is all going to boil down to teaching various difficulty partial fraction decomposition things, and some funny subtleties about the way in which you complete partial fractions. But basically, that's what there is. And the reason that you always end up with basically a partial fraction decomposition problem is that basically things in the Laplace transform table look like rational functions. And derivatives just kick s's out front. So when you go to solve for this Laplace transform of y, you just have a bunch of s's that you have to divide by, hence getting an even rationally or rational function. <laughs> Right, but it doesn't change categories. It's always kind of a rational function. Does that make sense? I saw something that said that the, the Laplace transform terms, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was like, like it terms multiplication and say integration and mm -hmm. derivatives into division or some. Multiplication is convolution. Yeah, multiplication turns into this thing called convolution. So that's another method I could have used here. So if I, if I was a little further afield, Instead of here, where I had the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s times mm. s minus 2, I may have thought to myself, basically the thing that you guys thought, right? Like, you look at it, you say, well, maybe it acts nice with multiplication. So you look at that as the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s times 1 over s minus 2. And then you, like, wish really hard at it that you knew what it did with this symbol. Okay, and it turns out that you can, and I'm stealing some of my own thunder from later, you can make this funny multiplication looking symbol called convolution that'll work. Like, it turns out that for appropriate definition of this symbol here, you can get away with this thing. The appropriate definition of that symbol there is kind of frankly annoying. <laughs> like, it's hard to execute, but it's not impossible to execute. Sometimes the partial fraction decomposition or sometimes the categories of the things you get are really, really horrible. And if that's true, then convolution can be your best friend. Cool. Is convolution something that's only used with the Laplace transforms, or is it something... No, convolution's, uh, convolution's kind of a function weighting property. Like, if you want to... If you want to run a weighted average between two functions, in some sense, convolution is that thing. It's not quite exactly that, but it gets used in areas where you want to kind of combine two functions in a problem. Good on it? Basic idea?